Our next talk for the day is by an educator who has led by example and his schools are a testament of that. I now call on stage Mr. Manit Jain, co-founder of Heritage Schools to talk about teacher development. What is more important, knowledge, skills or attitude? All are important, let me clarify. <laughs> when I was a young kid in grade 7 or 8, that's the oldest time I remember, I really started thinking about why I was learning when I was young. And I know many of you may have had those thoughts, but for me, it was almost paralyzing. I just could not relate to the education that I was getting. And there was so much taskfulness about it. I was getting conditioned to believe that the entire experience is about conformity. I was getting conditioned to believe that asking why is not important. I was getting conditioned to believe that inquiry doesn't matter, that purpose doesn't matter. I was getting trained for purposelessness. So Einstein said that education should be perceived as a valuable gift and not as a hard duty. You know what happens when you keep performing a hard duty for 14 years of your life? It doesn't leave you. That's something that I discovered when I started reflecting on my education as an adult, when I came on the other side of the table. That's when I realized what trauma it caused me, what it did to me, the kind of purposelessness that set in. So you don't suddenly go out of school excited about what you're going to study in college. You don't go to a workplace excited about something that you're passionate about or with any clear sense of purpose. I think I'm going to hold on for a second. Welcome, sir. Uh, so, when you lose that sense of purpose, and, and I can tell you that I've run sessions with parents, typically halls full of 500 people, and I ask them, so how many of you think you've truly found your calling? Typically, about 10 to 15 hands go up. What is even worse is this permeates into everything. The hard duty fracture permeates into everything. It goes way beyond jobs. So I, if, if you think about it, many of you probably get parents who are to be trained, should I say that, on spending quality time with their children. So even that comes with a sense of duty. Something that should come with a lot of beauty actually comes with a sense of beauty. Disturbed about all of these things, in the year 2004, we started our transformation journey. And it was quite a journey. For the first six months, we did everything that every other school does. A lot of trainings, on literacy, on numeracy, on multiple intelligences, classroom management, talk about all of the technical things. And then we even sent our teachers for a four-day retreat. And I had really benefited from one of these retreats. And we got back, and guess what happened? I was doing a reflection session and asked the teachers, how is it? And the first response, almost spontaneously was, it was a nice paid holiday. Okay, the person sitting in the room, anyhow. <laughs> and uh, a couple of months later, there was another teacher who had this blinding flash of the obvious in another reflection, and he, she said, now I get it. You want us to work? and you want us to think. And I was like, oh my God. And I asked her if that was sarcasm. And she said, no, not at all. When I got into the profession, this expectation was never said that I'd have to do either of the two things. So I was beginning to give up, honestly, getting completely frustrated with what was happening until I met this mentor of mine who explained to me 
that any meaningful change is going to happen if people experience pain around the current reality or some kind of a pull of something higher, something larger than themselves. And that's when I realized, that's when I understood that teacher empowerment is not about, not just about a whole lot of technical trainings. It really is about connecting people to a deeper sense of purpose. And if we want real impact, the only thing that is going to drive it is purpose. Now, how do you connect people to their sense of purpose? And you may argue, teachers, really? We know that most people come into this profession not really as the most preferred one. It's not a profession of choice for many people. Yeah? You may even think that many of them are in this job but feel trapped in some way. How do you get to inspire them? Yeah. I've worked directly with over a thousand teachers over the last 15 years in our three schools and in the teacher training program that we run. And I can tell you, I am yet to meet a single person, I am yet to meet a single person who does not have it within them. That sense of purpose, that hunger to grow, that hunger to learn, that search for meaning resides in everybody. So it's not something you need to build. It's just something you need to get them to become aware of. It is just about showing them that light that exists within. So we did, in preparation of the soil, five things. And the first thing is clarity and purity of intent at the level of leadership. Often, we ourselves are confused about why we want to change. Why is it even important to us? And then, what do we want to change? Why does it matter? And, and if we don't have that clarity ourselves, then we embrace mediocrity. Or we will not have the conviction to go on when the going gets tough, and the going is going to get tough. If you start transforming schools, and many of you have in this room, you know it is not an easy ride. So unless you have very strong conviction, you cannot go on. Niyat mehi niyati hai. So both purity and clarity of intent is extremely important to begin. The second one is vulnerability. And the challenge is that school leaders carry a very huge burden of knowing everything. You always have to know everything. So you're practically expected to be the Dharmendra of 1980s who can take bullets, who can ride the horse, who can, you know, just do pretty much everything. The quintessential hero of Bollywood. Yeah? Drop that burden. When you drop that burden of knowing, you give people the permission to be authentic. The trouble is, you don't want classrooms where a whole lot of children are sitting and listening and the teacher asks them, do you understand? And the kids don't have the courage to say, no ma'am, I don't. You want a school full of teachers where teachers can say, I don't know. And it is not going to happen unless you start saying, I don't know. For me, it was very easy. I didn't come from the education background. I decided, when I decided on the transformation, I decided I'm not going to have a school principal for three years because school principals always tell you why change cannot happen. And I don't want anybody like that in the room. Uh, that was 15 years ago, mind you. Uh, so, so, it was very easy for me to say I don't know because my journey started from a whole lot of pain from what I knew I did not want to do. I had no clue about what else to do. 
And that's why that thing happened just automatically. It was just osmosis. It just, just happened. So drop that burden. You'll feel powerless for some time, but then you'll feel very powerful. The third thing is belief, and belief has two dimensions. One is the belief that you demonstrate in people, and second is the sense of self-belief that you help build in them. Yeah. So demonstrating is easy. All you need to do is give them the space to make mistakes, give them the space to experiment, and tell them you can, even if you believe they can't. Please never say that. You never say that to a child, you never say that to a teacher, you never say that to any human being. Everybody can, nothing is impossible. On the other dimension, think about their sense of self-worth. And I've spoken to hundreds of teachers. When you get into deeper conversations, you find out, for the most part, their families themselves don't respect what they're doing. There is very little appreciation. Ek wajudi experience nahi karte this that identity is so weak and over the years it's only getting worse so how do you develop that sense of self worth where they believe they can and we did all kinds of crazy things you see shalini and misha in this picture 2004 october 2004 this is uh, the second phase six months so all kinds of things we did, climbing up rocks, climbing down walls, all the school, uh, riding the rapids, jumping off a cliff, getting people to talk in front of groups of 200 people when they hadn't even spoken in their own families. Just getting them to confront their fears and do what they think was impossible so they see that they're capable of a lot more than they think they are. And that to us is a very, very critical skill. I don't know, not skill, really. It's just essential to human empowerment. The philosophy at our school has always been, if you want to hold people accountable, please support them first. You can't just keep focusing on their deficits and not focusing on their capacities or not building their capacities. So the mantra really is tight support and loose control, yeah, and not the other way around. The fourth part is building a community. I think everybody needs to belong. In our retreats, we've had situations where people have shared stuff that they've never shared even with their families, providing those platforms for people to come together to promote a culture of trust, of collaboration, not of competition. And the essential ingredient for that, if there is one thing that is to be done, is change the power structures. Remove authority, remove fear. If you don't want fear in the classrooms, then how can you have your teachers fearful of being judged? So give them that space. Give them that space to be themselves. Give teachers some agency in the decisions that you make and see what kind of magic ensues. Build a shared vision, build shared values with them. These are all exercises we've been constantly doing. And the personal vision, invest in their personal vision. So there's an exercise that I've now done with at least 5,000 people. It's called the dream body exercise. I learned it from my mentor. And there we map dreams from the time that we were kids. Yeah. And when teachers did this exercise repeatedly, the pattern that we saw was that they had lofty dreams as kids and then they lost the grip on their dreams and then they got very practical and in the end, the dreams were at the lowest rung of Maslow's hierarchy, around safety, around absence of conflict in their lives. 
around absence of problems, not really an aspiration. Ghar mein sab thik rahe, bachche thik rahe, kalesh na ho. These are things we heard repeatedly. So give them those dreams. Let them see that they're capable of a lot more than they think they are. And then actually things start moving. They really start moving once they can dream. And then our kids can also become dreamers. But remember, invest in them as human beings. Don't invest in teachers as instruments for you to get something done. Show them true care, true compassion, true kindness, true love. I know all of this sounds fuzzy. I don't have tips or tricks to give you. I really am talking about stuff that has worked in my life. We did just these five things over the next six months and what we saw was one of the biggest experiments, I would say, at that time at least, in mainstream education in the country. The same teacher who said it was a nice paid holiday, became the head of the junior school within the next two months of making that statement. She's sitting right here, she's on the panel. Nisha said that. And the teacher who said uh, the thing about work and thing is still with us, is one of the chief teacher trainers, one of the most respected teachers in our entire community. And within six months, the experiment entailed no books, no periods, no subjects, no uniform, completely project-based experiential curriculum developed in-house from scratch by our own teachers ready for six months on the 1st of April when the session began in the year 2005. You can't even imagine the power that was unleashed when we did these five things right and when we connected people to their purpose. Uh, it was just, it, I think it was so life transforming for all of us who were there. Uh, it just seemed so unreal. My hope for this community is that we provide our teachers the space to be. That we'll do with teachers what we want them to do with the kids. And my hope also for this community is that you'd shed the burden of knowing. Plus, but I want you to carry another burden. Please carry the burden or the privilege you have. All privileges come with responsibilities. You're amongst the finest schools in the country. So the onus of educational transformation does not rest with CBSE or the policy makers or anybody else. You have to show the light. We all have to come together somehow to make this change. Whatever it takes, whether it is working with the policy makers, working with NCERT, working with the early childhood, uh, fellows working with test makers, whatever we need to do, clusters of kids around us, let our consciousness expand beyond our own children. It is not just for the children of our schools. We need to get every child there. Education is not a race to the top. It is a journey to get every child across to the promised land. And that journey begins with finding our own deepest purpose. It begins with us. Purpose is the only thing that drives impact. Thank you. Thank you, Manit, for a wonderful session.